Anaphylaxis is a full body systemic reaction to an allergen and can be life-threatening. It can be frightening to a person experiencing it, but also to a loved one who witnesses it and wants to help. Today, we'll be taking a look at anaphylaxis and how to take a deep breath and manage the situation. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network. Today's webinar helps Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Our speaker today is Dr. David Stukas. He's a professor of clinical pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University College of Medicine. At his institution, he serves as the Director of Food Allergy Treatment Center and Associate Director of the Pediatric Allergy Immunology Fellowship Training Program. Dr. Stukas is a member of the Board of Regents for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the social media editor and host of the podcast series for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and is one of 12 invited members for the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters for Allergy and Immunology. Dr. Stukas has published two textbooks and over 75 peer-reviewed manuscripts. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at AllergyKidsDoc, where he has amassed a over, over combined 46,000 followers. I know you've already had a busy day, Dr. Stukas. We're so glad you could be with us today, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I hope that this is informative for everybody, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today as well. Okay, here are my disclosures, which really shouldn't be relevant to what we're going to talk about today. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is really talk about why anaphylaxis is so hard for all of us to diagnose, uh, to try to demystify some of the, the uh, preconceived notions about it, and I ideally present some evidence and perspective that hopefully say it makes it less scary for everybody. Uh, and in putting this talk together, I, I really wanted to take a fresh perspective and look at an evidence-based approach towards uh, the diagnosis and management of it. And, and you'll see what I mean as we sort of get into things here. So here's my goal. Uh, I want to present information that makes you go, huh, that's interesting. I want to question your beliefs. Uh, I want to use evidence to, to offer new perspective. Uh, but really, I think we, it's time for all of us to take a fresh perspective when we think about anaphylaxis, and most importantly, how we educate patients and the general public about it, uh, because I think we, we've come a long way in understanding what this is and, and how to manage it. So let's start with some facts about anaphylaxis, and this is the dichotomy, because it can be life-threatening and absolutely can cause death, but it's also often self-resolved and often does not require emergency room care. And when I talk to patients and, and families, I like to talk about what's possible versus what's probable, what's likely versus what's unlikely. So it's unlikely that you're going to have a fatal anaphylactic reaction. It's most likely that it's actually going to be more mild and self-resolved or improve with epinephrine. And we're going to talk about what that means soon. But it's really challenging. It is filled with nuance and variables. And we're going to talk about why it's really hard to diagnose. And also, every individual has their own risk based upon their own um, other features they have and comorbid factors and conditions and cofactors and things like that. And it's really difficult to provide concrete information. I, I've had some very enlightening conversations with families of late where they get very frustrated because I can't tell them exactly when to use epinephrine. Uh, sometimes I tell them, if you want me to make it up, I'll go ahead and make it up to make it easier for you. But when there's a lot of folks out there that really are concrete in their thinking and anaphylaxis is filled with nuance, which makes that really challenging for folks. I want to start with this recent rostrum uh, that was uh, published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and Practice. Look at the title, Acute At-Home Management of Anaphylaxis, What's the Emergency? If that doesn't make you go, huh, what's going on here? I don't know what will. And this quote, this, this opinion goes against common teachings of the past, which dictated that any patient who had to inject epinephrine to treat a potentially anaphylactic event needed to activate EMS and or go to a hospital ED. It is time for us to question previously held beliefs about how we manage anaphylaxis. We're going to get back to this, but I wanted to lead with that and sort of plant that seed because that's how this afternoon is going to go, folks. All right, let's start with the basics. So what is an allergy? Well, you can look at various definitions, uh, one of which I found is a damaging immune response by the body to a substance, pollen, fur, particularly dust, which has become hypersensitive. 
that's a word salad of who knows what. Really, it's an abnormal response of the immune system to a harmless substance. So allergic reactions are caused by the immune system. Um, they should be reproducible every time. It's a cause and effect relationship. I'm exposed to my allergen, I have these symptoms. If I'm not exposed, I don't have these symptoms. But not all allergies are the same. Here's the obligatory immunology slide uh, every time we give a presentation. Uh, we all learn this in medical school, then forget this immediately after leaving, but as allergists and immunologists, we hold this near and dear to our hearts because there are different types of allergic or hypersensitivity reactions. What we're focusing on today are type 1 IgE antibody-mediated reactions. These occur very quickly, and these are the ones that can progress to anaphylaxis. Poison ivy is a type 4 delayed onset hypersensitivity. You're exposed to the oil from poison ivy, you're fine. And then hours later, oftentimes the next day, is when you develop the blistering rash. That's, a, that's an allergic reaction known as contact dermatitis, but it's very different than something that will cause anaphylaxis. These reactions don't cross over. So if you have a delayed hypersensitivity to something like nickel, that's not going to put you at risk to have anaphylaxis. So I just want to kind of um, make that clear for everybody who's listening. So why do we need to worry about this? Well, we know that it's relatively common. Uh, it affects a lot of people. We also know that the risk factors for people having anaphylaxis have increased significantly in recent years with you know, the number of children experiencing food allergies have nearly doubled over the past couple of decades. Hospitalizations have, in, have increased, but most importantly, quality of life can really suffer for those who have experienced anaphylaxis or are at risk to experience anaphylaxis in the future because they're always sort of walking around wondering, is, is today the day that I'm going to have a severe allergic reaction? Is this a situation that's going to you know, cause me to have anaphylaxis? Uh, so it's a real burden for those who have to live with this. There are various triggers for anaphylaxis. Interestingly, medications and in-hospital anaphylaxis are the most common causes from the treatments that we give, whether it's medications such as antibiotics, or other types of drugs used to treat a variety of conditions, or um, sometimes vaccines. Insects can cause anaphylaxis as well, specifically to those that have venom, such as honeybees or wasps or hornets. Foods can cause anaphylaxis, uh, including milk and egg and peanuts and tree nuts. And then there are new forms of anaphylaxis that have been recognized over the last decade or so, such as alpha-gal, which is a unique delayed onset reaction to red meat, uh, which often develops in, in those who have been bitten by a tick known as a lone star tick. So there are a variety of triggers that can cause cause anaphylaxis. Also, idiopathic anaphylaxis, which means we don't have an identifiable cause, which is a really scary diagnosis because we can't tell patients why they experienced anaphylaxis or when they're going to have it again. So what is anaphylaxis? Well, we didn't really have a great definition of this until, oh, roughly 15, 16 years ago. And there was an um, a, a expert group got together across the world, and they came up with a definition that anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction that's rapid in onset and can, can cause death. And there are criteria that were developed really for all of us, based, depending upon your background. It doesn't matter whether you're a patient, uh, you're an emergency responder, or you're a physician. And there are different criteria. So this is sort of the, the hodgepodge. I'll go through this individually. But most importantly, I want to point out that anaphylaxis is highly likely when any of these following three are fulfilled. So there's three different criteria to think through. It's a combination of symptoms. One, acute onset of skin symptoms, which can include itching, flushing, hives, or swelling, and some component of breathing difficulty, which can include a cough or, or wheezing, or you can have uh, involvement of the cardiovascular system and have lowered blood pressure. Not all cases of anaphylaxis require or have skin symptoms. They do occur in the majority of them, but the absence of skin findings doesn't mean you're not having anaphylaxis. These are the criteria that satisfy almost all the cases. The second criteria includes gastrointestinal symptoms. This is more common with food allergies or through ingestion of an allergen. And this can be vomiting, abdominal pain, or diarrhea. And then lastly, there is some provision in here for those who have isolated hypotension or loss of blood pressure. Um, and this is really difficult to diagnose when you're at school or at home or things like that. And the most common scenario would be you take somebody with a known allergy, you knowingly give them what they're allergic to, and then they pass out. Uh, so that would be an example of somebody receiving an allergy shot in the allergist's office. Uh, so that's when we would want to recognize this as anaphylaxis and treat with epinephrine. There are other factors to consider. These aren't the only criteria out there. There are other criteria, such as the Brighton collaboration, which included severe gastrointestinal symptoms in the primary criteria. The World Allergy Organization came out with different, you know, some um, uh, criteria in 2020, uh, which includes acute onset skin or mucosal symptoms, plus one or more, whether it's a respiratory symptoms or hypotension or severe GI symptoms. And then I also want to point out, and this is really, really important, 
not all anaphylaxis is the same. There are examples of mild anaphylaxis, those who have hives and they vomit one time. That is anaphylaxis. Or those who may have hives and then they have you know, upper respiratory congestion or sneezing. That technically is anaphylaxis. Um, so not every case of anaphylaxis means you're going to have airway compromise or, or be at risk for having a, a fatal reaction. There's differences in, in the severity that can occur. There are also mimickers as well, and we see this all the time. There are a lot of other conditions that can create symptoms that look like anaphylaxis, particularly in those who are prone to have anaphylaxis. Uh, this can include anxiety, which can cause shortness of breath and difficulty breathing and tingling sensations and things like that. We'll talk about vasovagal reactions in a second. Syncope means passing out. Um, and you can have people who have subjective symptoms, uh, such as tingling and itching or various rashes. And all of the symptoms that can occur during anaphylaxis can occur for unrelated, non-allergic, non-anaphylactic uh, causes. So that's an important thing to recognize as well. It's a clinical diagnosis, which makes it really hard because you have to basically look at somebody and say you're having anaphylaxis, which requires context. It's very rapid in onset. It'd be very unlikely for anaphylaxis to occur hours after exposure to an allergen. One of the exceptions would be that alpha-gal syndrome that I mentioned before for those who have the red meat allergy. So we put it in context of, did you have recent exposure to something that you're suspected to be allergic to? It's gonna happen really fast after exposure. People look unwell. This is something I counsel families on all the time. If you're worried that your child's having an acute allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, they're not going to be very happy. They're gonna be very uncomfortable. Uh, they're going to look unwell. Their demeanor is going to change. And that's the clue that we use in the office setting during our oral food, or oral food challenges as well. We do have some biomarkers that can be useful, one of which is called a serum tryptase level, which can be obtained. The timing matters. We have to obtain this blood sample within one hour, I'm sorry, one, between one and four hours after the onset of anaphylaxis. If you wait too long, it's not gonna be very reliable, but we don't get the result back immediately. So we're not gonna use this to diagnose anaphylaxis in the moment. That result can take days to come back. It also doesn't have to be elevated in all cases of anaphylaxis. It's notorious that food-induced anaphylaxis may not have an elevated serum tryptase at all. So it's just one biomarker that can be used to help, especially for those who are having recurrent episodes and we're not quite sure what's going on. It can aid in the diagnosis for more long-term management, but not in the acute setting. Some of the common overlaps. So anaphylaxis, people who pass out for a variety of reasons and those who have anxiety, they share a lot of the came, a lot of the same symptoms. We saw this a lot when we started administering um, the, the COVID vaccines when they were first available. A lot of people were having a lot of the symptoms may look like an allergic reaction, but it really wasn't due to a true allergies such as tingling. They felt lightheaded. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety involved just based upon everything that we were all dealing with at the time. But with anaphylaxis, we really should see um, you know, objective symptoms when we look at somebody, whether it's hives or swelling. Uh, of course, those can be absent as well, as opposed to those who are you know, having more anxiety or, or, or syncope. Uh, they can be more lightheaded and dizzy and tingling. Their skin's actually going to be more pale and clammy and cool. They're not going to have hives and things like that. And then I just want to take a moment uh, based on personal experience, but this is a very powerful thing. My wife is an emergency room physician, and uh, she was removing a splinter from my hand this past summer. And I was watching her do it. In my mind, I was fine. I had no issues with her digging this, this rather large splinter out of my hand. But then all of a sudden, I felt tunnel vision coming in on me and I felt very lightheaded and I started to get short of breath and I felt like I was gonna pass out and I started sweating and I got very clammy. I experienced a vagal response. It was very powerful and I said to my wife, I'm vagling, I need to sit down. <laughs> and, and I was fine, everything went away, but it is a really powerful phenomenon. And this is very common during blood draws, people who have needle phobia, during vaccinations and immunizations. Uh, and this can be um, inappropriately diagnosed as anaphylaxis in these episodes. So I just want people to be aware of one of these common mimickers as well. What's the best way to determine anaphylaxis? Did the person just receive something that they're known to be allergic to, or did they receive something that was a common cause of allergies? If you're just walking along going about your business, or you're not exposed to anything that's a known cause of allergies or anaphylaxis, and you have various symptoms, it's less likely to be anaphylaxis. Now, what's actually going on inside the body? When anaphylaxis occurs, uh, various allergy cells or different cells get activated. We have mast cells, which are present in all the tissues throughout our body. We have basophils and neutrophils and monocytes, which are in the peripheral circulation. And these all have different types of chemicals and mediators. Histamine is one of the main components of an allergic or anaphylactic reaction, a type one allergic reaction. And histamine, as I'll show you, can cause a lot of the symptoms that occur. 
uh, that gets released very rapidly. It's present in these preformed granules and these cells open up and release histamine, which causes symptoms very fast. But that's not the only mediator. There are other chemicals that can be involved that can cause very similar symptoms, and they also can signal for other inflammatory mediators to come and cause additional symptoms as well. But when we think about the effect of, of these different chemicals throughout the body, any organ system can be involved. In the upper respiratory symptom, you, you can have acute onset, severe uh, nasal congestion, sneezing, itching, things like that. Uh, we already talked about the cardiovascular system where you get the blood vessels dilating and you have lower blood pressure, people can pass out. Inside the airways, it can cause constriction of the muscles around the airways, which can make people have coughing or wheezing or difficulty breathing. It can cause cramping um, and constriction in, in the digestive tract. Uh, for women, the, they can have uterine contractions, which can be very, very powerful and very uncomfortable as well. And in the skin, it can cause flushing or hives or swelling and itching and things like that. This was a, a, a updated practice parameter that the Joint Task Force and a work group came up with in 2020 that was published. This was a special analysis called a GRADE analysis, which really looked at the evidence supporting uh, specific questions related to anaphylaxis. And this was focused on risk factors for biphasic anaphylaxis, as well as the treatment of anaphylaxis. And I just want to go through some of these, um, these highlights because I think it's really important. These are some of the overall good practice statements. Number one, Administration of epinephrine is the only first-line treatment for anaphylaxis. So that is very important. If you have anaphylaxis, epinephrine is the treatment. We'll spend more time talking about that in just a moment. Number two, do not delay the administration of epinephrine because that can be associated with higher morbidity or mortality. So we want to recognize anaphylaxis, use epinephrine um, quickly, and not delay treatment for any reason. And then after diagnosis and treatment, people should be monitored until symptoms have fully resolved. And you're going to say, Dave, wait a minute, you just led with an article saying that you can manage this at home. Well, you need to be monitored at home. And um, we'll talk about the setting and what that means as well. One of the questions that was looked at in these practice parameters was, should we be using glucocorticoids or things like steroids or prednisone or antihistamines to prevent biphasic anaphylaxis? Biphasic anaphylaxis is anaphylaxis that occurs for whatever reason symptoms are resolved, whether it's self-resolved or with treatment, and then they come back again uh, some period of time later. It can be within an hour, it can be hours later. We used to think biphasic anaphylaxis was much more common than it actually is, and now it's recognized as occurring in less than 5%, usually about 4% of people are at risk to have biphasic anaphylaxis, but we can actually predict who's at risk to have it, which we'll talk about in a moment. So this question looks at, should we, should we be treating with steroids and antihistamines to prevent biphasic anaphylaxis? And what the recommendations show is that epinephrine is the only treatment for anaphylaxis. When you look at all of the evidence, antihistamines and steroids don't actually treat anaphylaxis or prevent biphasic anaphylaxis. Is there a role for them in the management? Well, potentially. So antihistamines can certainly help certain symptoms, especially if there's itching, but there really is a very limited, if any, role for steroids in the treatment of anaphylaxis. And the reason why is because the onset of action is so slow. We don't want to wait for steroids to do anything to actually treat the acute symptoms. We want to give epinephrine. And I know a lot of you are saying, wait a minute, every time I go to the emergency room, this is what they give me, the cocktail. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right way to, to approach it. And there's a reason why these practice parameters were developed. Because when you look at the evidence, and this is a clinical pathway we just updated at our institution, there really is a very limited, if any, rule to use steroids in the treatment of anaphylaxis. So let's talk about epinephrine. So we want to give epinephrine early. Uh, all, you know, the evidence supports this. It treats all the symptoms associated with anaphylaxis. And what this does is it's sort of all those different parts of the body that I showed you just a few slides ago that can be affected in anaphylaxis, epinephrine can reverse those symptoms. So it doesn't really care where it's occurring. It reverses all of them. It can also help prevent additional mediator release. And it works very, very fast. Um, there's different doses that we give based upon the weight. Uh, we'll talk about auto injectors in a second. Most of us use 25 kilograms as the cutoff when we go from a 0.15 milligram to a 0.3 milligram dose in the auto injectors. There's different parameters for using various solutions in the hospital setting or through EMS or things like that. We always want to administer epinephrine intramuscularly on the outside part of the thigh. There's very large blood vessels there. The epinephrine can get absorbed and gets transferred throughout the body very, very quickly. We don't want to give it subcutaneously under the skin or in the shoulder or anywhere else. Uh, so that's how we want to administer it. There are different auto injectors available. This uh, talk isn't here to endorse any particular one, but it's really important for those who prescribe auto injectors, for those who have them prescribed to them, to understand that the technique varies based upon the device that you have. 
Now, we've seen over the last few years, insurance companies will vary in their coverage of these devices, and there are many patients that have previously had one device covered by their insurance company, which then gets switched without any notification, and then you have to learn how that device works, because uh, there's slightly there's slight differences in the technique. But all of them, um, you know, contain the same dose of epinephrine, whether it's the 0.15 milligram or the 0.3 milligram, with the one exception, the OBIQ device is available in a 0.1 milligram um, dose for infants uh, who are less than 15 kilograms. There are other factors to consider when we talk about auto-injectors. So the needle length change is based upon the dosage from 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams. So sometimes we actually go with a little bit higher dose, especially if there's somebody who has very, very large thighs or we need to make sure that needle goes, you know, wants to be long enough to go in the muscle. On the flip side, if the needle is too long and somebody doesn't have a lot of fat in their thigh, we may actually insert that into the bone as opposed to the muscle. So we want to be cognizant of that as well. And there's been a lot of people looking at the stability of these over time because the cost has been so exorbitant over the last few years. But there's been a lot of press about this. When you look at the stability of these of epinephrine and auto injectors over time, oftentimes the prescription only lasts for about 12 months, but the the medication is often viable for much much longer than that. Uh, and when you look at the studies looking at this, most of them are very good for one to two years afterwards. And I know a lot of schools or other settings want to have an up-to-date prescription. And the advice most allergists give to their, their patients is keep, you know, the, the expired ones on hand because they're still going to work, um, you know, if you need to use them. And they're often great to have as backups. That way you don't have to spend the money to have them and things like that. Of course, we always want to promote having an up-to-date, you know, prescription as much as possible. But if you all you have available is an outdated uh, prescription for epinephrine, absolutely use it because it's not going to cause any harm and it's very likely it's still going to offer some benefit. The exposure to temperatures is on the package inserts for all these as well but when you actually look at the studies um, it shows that if you expose it to extreme heat so you don't want to leave these in the glove compartment of the car in the summertime or when the sun is hitting it because uh, that can reduce activity. I believe the package inserts for most of them have 86 degrees Fahrenheit is the upper limit. However, freezing thawing may not alter the activity though. Uh, that being said, if you have left your device out in extremes of temperature, absolutely, you know, call your personal allergist and talk to them about whether you need to replace it. And then we always have to factor in cost as well. And that's really a, a moving target over the last couple of years. Now we know, and it is well documented, that epinephrine is underused. It's not only just underused by patients, it's underused by medical personnel, by, uh, by EMS responders, uh, by physicians. Um, it is just underused across the board. And we know in multiple different settings that you know, roughly 50% of people experiencing anaphylaxis never receive epinephrine. And we'll talk about in a second what happens to them because most of them still get better. Uh, but we're just not using it for a variety of reasons. One of which is that anaphylaxis is hard to diagnose. Either the symptoms aren't recognized or I'm not quite sure when to use it. Oftentimes it's not available. Uh, people often don't even fill their epinephrine prescription. Or if they fill it, they don't have it with them when they're dining at restaurants or when they're actually exposed to their allergen, uh, such as landscaping if they have venom allergy or things like that. Uh, even if it is available, sometimes it's used incorrectly. So the technique is something that needs to be practiced as much as possible. And there are multiple great training devices that are widely available to help people practice with the device in their hand. A lot of people have misconceptions about the side effects. And I, I heard from a family last week that they were told um, by their you know, pediatrician not to use epinephrine because it could cause a, a heart attack in their baby. And that's simply not true. You know, a lot of the side effects with epinephrine are associated with doses that are given intravenously in the hospital setting or through large boluses. Uh, the side effects are minimal when given through an auto injector in the doses that are prescribed. Uh, folks do have needle phobia and they're afraid to use that because of that reason as well. And frankly, a lot of folks just aren't given, you know, good concrete information about you know signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis or when to use epinephrine so there's a misunderstanding of when to use it and when not to use it one thing I do want to mention is th these are very exciting times in regards to um, lots of uh, folks looking at alternate ways to deliver epinephrine. Uh, these are some of the devices that have, have all been investigated in recent years, and they presented abstracts at some of our professional meetings. Um, to my understanding, uh, the, the one on the, on the top left through ARS Pharmaceuticals is the one that's closest to potentially going to the FDA for approval, but I'm sure the others will, will follow behind. There's two intranasal devices, and there's one sublingual device as well that you put under the tongue. Um, and they've all presented their data recently, and hopefully these will be available in the near future, which will be a nice option for our patients uh, to consider, especially for those that you know don't want to use auto injectors for whatever reason. And these these aren't the only ones. There are alternative devices being investigated uh, of different ways of administering epinephrine through the skin and, and things like that. So stay tuned in the space. Uh, this is going to be rapidly evolving in the next couple of years, but these are very exciting times for all of us to be aware of. 
But that leads to the next point of, well, how is this studied? So it's kind of like the parachute, right? There's no randomized controlled study that shows that, you know, those who jump out of an airplane won't survive without opening their parachute. It's not going to be done. And there are no randomized controlled trials demonstrating that there's the benefit of using epinephrine autoinjectors in treating anaphylaxis in humans. Uh, there's studies in dogs and animals and things like that. But we don't have those, those classic, you know, this is the gold standard. What do we have, though? We, well, we have a lot of real-world experience with the auto-injectors. And then with these new devices, what you're going to see is they're going to use studies looking at pharmacokinetics and ph pharmacodynamics. So how is the epinephrine distributed throughout the body? What effect is it having on the end organs? And how does that compare to what we know through the auto-injectors and things like that? And they're studying them in, in, in adults with different comorbid conditions, such as those who have allergic rhinitis and nasal polyps and things along those lines. So that's where the studies are going to go. And then we may lead from there uh, to, you know, using it in more of a controlled setting and things like that. But I just want everybody to be aware of that's pretty much where we stand when it comes to our understanding of epinephrine and the, and the evidence to support it and where we're going to move from there. Let's go back to the, the practice parameters for a second because with these biphasic anaphylaxis risk factors, as I mentioned, you know, old outdated teaching was 20% of people with anaphylaxis will have a biphasic reaction. Well, it turns out that was, you know, you know, five times higher than what the actual risk is, but we can narrow that down even further. And I'm going to, I put these recommendations out there, but I'm going to break this down for you. So what we, what we look at, what we found when you look at the evidence, that if somebody with anaphylaxis comes to the emergency room, but their symptoms have already resolved or they're slowly getting better, whether or not they received one dose of epinephrine or it's self-resolved, and they don't require additional treatment, those people are at very low risk for experiencing biphasic anaphylaxis, and they don't need to be monitored for four to six hours. How many times does somebody go to the emergency room and they stay there for six hours and nothing happens? These are the people that are at low risk, and we can actually probably discharge them within an hour if they're already feeling better, as long as we have appropriate follow-up and education and things like that. However, if somebody does come to the emergency room with anaphylaxis and they have severe respiratory symptoms, or they've already received two or more doses of epinephrine, or they've required additional treatment in the emergency room, even if their symptoms are now resolved, those are the people that are at higher risk to experience biphasic anaphylaxis, and those are the ones that should be monitored for at least four to six hours or potentially longer, especially if they have a history and biphasic anaphylaxis. So we really can make anaphylaxis a much more individualized and nuanced uh, approach. It's not one size fits all anymore. What happens when people go to the emergency room? Well, this has actually been studied and it's well documented that epinephrine is often not given. So even if you go to the emergency room with actual active anaphylaxis, epinephrine still is often not given up to 50% of the time. Instead, they're treated with steroids, which don't work, or they're treated with antihistamines, or they're treated with things like you know, acid blockers that have really no effect whatsoever in anaphylaxis. And then oftentimes people are observed for hours without any additional intervention. Um, so even if we tell people knee jerk, just go to the emergency room, we have to be thoughtful what actually occurs there and there's a lot of education that needs to you know continue to happen I mentioned before that we're we're already revamping our clinical pathway at my institution for those patients who go to the emergency room it's going to require a ton of follow-up from all of us to make sure that the pathway is being followed that people understand why uh, we need to make these changes and what to do with these patients when they actually arrive now we learned a lot of lessons during the, the COVID-19 pandemic when people were rightfully, you know, afraid to go to the emergency room. They didn't want to be exposed to COVID. And we're seeing that again now. Uh, you know, we're seeing abnormally long wait times when you go to the emergency room because of surges in RSV and influenza, and we still have COVID. Uh, so um, a lot of you know revamped approaches were taken during the pandemic as far as at-home management of anaphylaxis, and we can absolutely learn. Um, some lessons from that approach. Uh, so it just it was never really forced upon us before, but now this is you know a time of great adaptation, and this is one of the areas where we really adapted. And this leads us back to that study that I mentioned, or that rostrum that I mentioned at the very beginning. So this goes back to it, um, and this is the the reference for you. And there's a nice algorithm there. And that what this walks through basically is that you know for most people when they have anaphylaxis, if you receive epinephrine the vast majority of people are going to start to improve relatively rapidly and they can be observed at home. Uh, so there is provision here for educating people. It has to, it requires a good understanding of this. It requires the right patient, a shared decision-making with their allergist, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then there are some people out there that may elect. This may be their, their preference to just treat and stay at home. A couple of thoughts. One is um, some people have been led to believe that if you give epinephrine, you have to go to the emergency room because it's a dangerous treatment option. That's simply not true. 
Number two, many people are reluctant to use epinephrine because they don't want to go to the emergency room. So I've had many conversations of, I'd much rather have you give epinephrine and observe for 10, 15 minutes. If things are resolving, um, you're probably going to be fine uh, as opposed to not giving it because you don't want to go to the emergency room. So we have to consider those aspects as well. Now, what about risk factors for severe anaphylaxis? This is anaphylaxis of all causes, whether it's medications and drugs or venom or, or food or things like that. Uh, when, and most of this is gonna come from either registry data or, or retrospective analyses or things like that. But there's been a few different risk factors identified. More importantly, there's been cofactors that have been identified. So we know that the elderly population, those with underlying mastocytosis or, or mast cell disorders are more likely to have more severe symptoms if those mast cells get activated for whatever reason, especially anaphylaxis. Exercise has been recognized as a cofactor, and there's a reason why those who receive oral immunotherapy for food allergies as a way to desensitize and protect them against severe reactions from trace exposures, um, they're, they're advised not to exercise for two hours after every dose, every day, because that can increase the severity of a reaction. Insects or anything that's injected into the body, whether it's antibiotics or drugs or venom, uh, is a, a risk factor for more severe uh, presentation. Same thing with drugs. Uh, if somebody who's using beta blockers or ACE inhibitors because they have underlying cardiovascular disease, they're at higher risk to experience more severe symptoms during anaphylaxis. Male gender, I don't quite know what to do with that, but if you look at all the registries, it's in, it seems that men tend to have more severe anaphylaxis compared to women. And then those who already have underlying stress or psychological burden tend to have more severe symptoms. And I say good luck with that during the pandemic because I think that applies to all of us. Now, this is a graphic that a lot of folks don't respond well to because it, it tends to minimize the, the risk for fatal anaphylaxis. But I think it's really important for all of us to understand because this actually puts things into perspective. And when we talk about understanding anaphylaxis and risk, uh, you know, oftentimes the, the perception of risk doesn't match the reality of it. And I started recently asking, you know, parents of children with food allergy, you know, how, because a lot of times they'll tell you the number one fear is that their child is going to die from food allergy. And I asked them, how many, how many children do you think die from food allergy a year in the United States? I received answers anywhere from 50 to 50,000. Uh, and that's really, really enlightening because the answer is probably, you know, a, a couple of dozen or less than 50. Uh, and we can tease out even more, you know, who's really at risk from that. So our perception of risk oftentimes doesn't match the reality of it. And that's really important when we're providing education, and helping people live with anaphylaxis, especially those at risk for it. So when it comes to fatal anaphylaxis, medications are the most common cause in adults, often occurring in the hospital setting, and then foods are the most common cause in children, but it's still extremely rare. So just because you have a food allergy doesn't mean that, you know, fatality from that is a realistic or expected outcome. There are risk factors identified. Delayed administration of epinephrine is associated with the vast majority of, of people who have fatal anaphylaxis. Asthma is questionable. Um, and because the reason why is because there's a lot of people out there that have asthma, but asthma is highly variable. And just because you have a diagnosis of asthma doesn't 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 necessarily mean you're at risk to develop severe or fatal anaphylaxis, although asthma has been reported in the majority of people who experience food-induced fatal anaphylaxis. This is more common in adolescents and young adults. It's extremely rare in toddlers and school-aged children. So that's something else that we can counsel patients and families on in regards to risk for this. And then there are certain foods that are more likely to cause anaphylaxis, although this certainly can occur with milk and egg and things like that. Um, and, and peanuts and tree nuts and shellfish have been identified uh, more often than not as those who have fatal anaphylaxis. But we have to reconcile that with the, the evidence that shows that 80% of those who have anaphylaxis have it resolved spontaneously or within minutes of treatment. So not everybody who has experienced anaphylaxis or who has a certain diagnosis is at risk to have a fatal anaphylactic event. We know that only 10% of reactions have a suboptimal response to the first dose and only you know, two to 3% require two or more doses. So that is the reality on the right side of the screen. Um, and that's what we can counsel our patients uh, in regards to and when it comes to risk. But that's not the message that's often sent out there. And, you know, every one of these food allergy fatalities is absolutely tragic and it's heartbreaking. And these are what receive the most media attention. You're never going to see a headline that says a million children with peanut allergy went to school today and had no issues whatsoever. But that's the reality of this diagnosis. But what does get circulated very widely are these unbalanced media stories. And it, it tends to falsely elevate the perception of risk for those that live with food allergy. This is one example. Uh, this was from two years ago. There was a, next to Boston Children's Museum, a new restaurant opened and the name of the restaurant was PB&J Cafe. 
And what they were going to do is they were going to serve a variety of different foods, including peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, this was the response. This actually garnered national attention. This was on the Today Show and others. This was on the Facebook page. I talked about there's going to be major peanut oil contamination throughout the facility. You know, gluten may not, you know, kill anybody, but if you come into contact with peanut butter, you could die. This is so crazy and out of touch. And peanut can be airborne. So all these misconceptions about risk abound, but this is the reality of what when people aren't given the right evidence-based information, this is how anxiety manifests when they try to live with food allergy or anaphylaxis and things like that. Of note, they uh, eventually succumbed and they changed the name of the restaurant to the Stonewall Kitchen, I believe, and they still serve peanut butter and jelly. And to date, I'm not aware of anybody who transferred peanut butter from their hands to anything in Boston Children's that caused a severe anaphylactic reaction to somebody with peanut allergy. We know that people are often prone to if then thinking. One of my favorite books that I read to our children when they were younger was if you give a mouse a cookie. So for those of you who know it, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's gonna ask for a glass of milk. If you ask for a glass of milk, he's gonna ask for this, he's gonna ask for that. So it's if then thinking. And a lot of times uh, that's where our minds wander. Uh, and when you have a diagnosis filled with uncertainty such as food allergy or anaphylaxis, it's very normal for people to think, well, what if I'm exposed to trace amounts and what if that causes these symptoms? And what if my auto injector uh, misfires or doesn't work? And what if, what if, what if. So we can address a lot of these through anticipatory guidance. And this is one example of, of some really scary information. This was a, a video that was shared on a uh, social media of a teacher saying she, she makes all of her students wash their hands, which I think is a great idea for a variety of reasons. But then she went on to say, because if they eat something uh, during lunch and they don't wash their hands, and they come back into the classroom and they play with blocks, they could transfer invisible proteins from their hands to the blocks. And then somebody with food allergy could come along and they could touch the blocks. And if they put their mouth and if they put their hand in their mouth, then they're now transferring it mucosally and that's gonna cause a, a severe anaphylactic reaction. You know, is that possible? Perhaps. Is that realistic? Absolutely not. Uh, so exposure to invisible proteins on, on surfaces, that would be a very, very scary world to live in if that was a realistic risk for causing severe anaphylactic reactions. But that's the message that's often being sent. Uh, and it's really scary. And then, of course, we see all the messages about, you know, peanut-free schools and, uh, and and ball games where people can go and sit in the peanut-free section or, or playgrounds. And, and, you know, while these are not medically necessary and all of the recent school food allergy guidelines for management of food allergies in schools, all of them specifically say there is no evidence that supports, um, you know, any type of food ban. Uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, they actually may increase the risk for, for potential food allergy reaction. You can't enforce these. And if you have a peanut-free school, that does nothing to protect the child who has a milk allergy or egg allergy who could be at risk to have a reaction as well. But this sends a very, very strong negative message that it's not safe for you unless it is nut-free or things like that. And all of this combined uh, really has created a culture of fear surrounding these different diagnoses and anaphylaxis. And I think now we know enough about this that we can address this and we can talk about risk in a very nuanced, individualized way. And that comes back to us as medical professionals about what we do with that. We need to address anxiety. That's a normal part of living with many of these diagnoses. A lot of that comes from us not spending the time addressing these things. And, and more often than not, People falsely equate, if you have a diagnosis with a food allergy, that means you're going to have anaphylaxis. If you ever get any type of exposure to that food, and that means you're going to die. Well, as I've already presented to you, there's a lot of dots in there that don't necessarily connect for the vast majority of people. And it's not fair unless we actually address that and let people know that this is what it takes to get to this point, And here's the reality of the situation. And by the way, there are many steps that you can take that are very practical that can reduce the risk for all these things along the way. There's a lot of misconceptions from all of us on the healthcare side. If we're not providing the information and discuss risk and self-management skills and prognosis, then our patients are left to fend for themselves and they're gonna go online and they're gonna get you know, bad information and, and, and little tidbits that are either outdated or they're, or they're taken without context. Or you can have people who practice very conservative medicine, they're telling people what to do, as opposed to participating in, in shared decision making. And I, I really think if anybody out there, if you feel that you're qualified to prescribe epinephrine or tell somebody that they're at risk to having anaphylaxis, then we need to make sure we have the right diagnosis and we need to avoid overdiagnosis and unnecessary dietary elimination or, or things like that based upon testing alone. We need to spend the time educating and teaching them. These are the steps, the easy steps you can take to reduce your risk significantly uh, from having any type of alert reaction. Talk about risk in a nuanced way. Put it in proper context. Have that conversation with patients. Anticipate that anxiety is going to occur and then give them ongoing support. There shouldn't be a, here you have anaphylaxis, here's your epinephrine, have a nice life. This should be, I'm here to support you. I want to be a resource for you. 
because it is a life-altering diagnosis. And if we don't spend the time listening and educating, anticipating needs, people are going to look for information on their own. That's what any of us would do. And they're going to, you know, look to friends and online support groups. And unfortunately, they're going to be subject to anecdotes and a lot of fear-mongering messages, or people are going to extrapolate their experience and think that it applies to them. And you're going to get very extreme emotional examples. And this can really impact quality of life. And we know that, you know, I, I encourage all of you, spend some time on your, your common search engines and look for, you know, some of these questions and look at the information that goes through, click through multiple different pages, go to those resources and see the information that's being provided and see how scary it is. So who has the time to do all this? Well, we need to make time for it. We need to match our education and provide, you know, the preferred learning style of every patient. Maybe they're not ready to receive that message right there in the office that day. So can we have resources on our websites or, or give videos, involve our staff in education? follow up with them, really, you know, be a resource and, and promote questions through the electronic health record. And then the words that we use matter. We shouldn't be telling people you have a deadly peanut allergy based upon the size of your skin test or blood test. It's not true. It's not what these tests measure. We need to clarify the diagnosis, use words like risk all the time, talk about risk because that matters and that changes based upon all these different variables. And we need to provide options and offer guidance. We shouldn't be telling people what to do. And these are questions that need to be asked for, for every individual. Do all exposures pose the same risk for causing reaction? We know that we can take 100 people with peanut allergy and they can, they're all going to have variable response to different threshold amounts and different symptoms and things like that. What about trace exposures and cross contact and things like that? And then does each individual with a certain allergy carry the same risk for any reaction or severe reaction? This was another recent publication, and it's a little bit of a, a, provo a provocative title, but if we think about it, these are some of the experts in our field. These are people who, who understand the pathophysiology and management of food allergy, and what this talks about really is that there's a lot of people out there that aren't truly severely allergic to foods, even though they have a food allergy diagnosis, and we can try to you know, sort of phenotype and identify them. This graphic shows the eliciting dose for 50% of the population across hundreds and thousands of food challenges. If you look at that, 50% of people with peanut allergy won't have any reaction at all until they eat at least two thirds of a peanut. Now, of course, that means that half of them will have a reaction, but it doesn't mean they're gonna have anaphylaxis from those exposures, but we can identify these, these patients. We can talk about risk. We can offer oral food challenges in a very supervised, structured way to, uh, to gain information and really make this an, an empowering thing to live with. And then of course we have all the precautionary labels which have zero regulation whatsoever and don't confer risk. Uh, and if we're telling people that you know you can't eat any of these things that have these labels on them, what kind of impact does that have on their quality of life as well? Uh, when we know that the vast majority of these items don't contain any allergen at all, let alone enough to cause a severe allergic reaction or any allergic reaction. So I'm not saying that everybody out there should you know eat these things, but I'm saying you need to have that conversation and have that that discussion on a one-on-one -on -one level to discuss you know what's my risk if I eat these things. And then we need to provide written information. This is one example from the American Academy of Pediatrics of a written treatment plan that it can be shared with anybody at school and teachers uh, and other caregivers that really walks through. These are the symptoms of an allergic reaction. Here's what medication to use when these symptoms occur. Uh, here's when to call 911, things like that. There are other versions of this that offer you know, uh, boxes such as if you think you ate your allergen, give epinephrine. Well, most allergists would say that's probably not good advice because one, uh, you know, what happens if no symptoms occur at all, if you're not even sure if you ate it? Number two, what happens if the onset of symptoms is 30 minutes later? That epinephrine may be out of your system already, so you may be treating too early. So, And it also sends a very scary message of, oh my gosh, if you accidentally took a bite of this, that means you're going to have a severe reaction. We have time to wait until symptoms occur, time to take a deep breath, and know what to do about it. And we need to offer anticipatory guidance at every visit as, as we sort of wrap up here and time for questions. At the initial consultation, spend that time educating, clarify the diagnosis, talk about risk, talk about all these strategies. And every follow-up visit, you know, talk about how things change based upon the age of the patient. Things are very different when we're managing this in an infant or toddler or school-age child compared to an adolescent. If you really want to know what keeps me up at night, I tell this to parents all the time, I don't worry about the school-aged child who's at risk to have anaphylaxis. I worry about the teenager who is likely not going to have their epinephrine with them or, or use it whenever they need to use it, or they may be more subject to peer pressure, things like that. So that's where I spend more of my time really you know, focused on that. I try to reassure you know, other, uh, other ages. And we talk about accidental exposures, what happened, what questions do you have? 
and then shared decision making. This really is a, it's the way we need to move. We should move away from this paternalistic way of managing patients and saying, you know, you absolutely need to do this. I'm the I'm the expert. This is what you need to do. No, we need to talk about values and preferences and, and discuss options. This is not one size fits all. Going back to the at home management of anaphylaxis, if there are patients out there that are capable, willing, and adherent to do this, and they have access to two or more epinephrine doses, and they have a clear understanding, that may be the way to go for them. Um, so there's no absolutes anymore when it comes to diagnosis or management of anaphylaxis. Uh, and then we also have to consider other variables such as children who are attending daycare school and when people are dining out at restaurants or during travel and things like that. Uh, as we wrap up, future approaches. So there's really encouraging uh, research looking at ways of, of blocking the IgE antibody. Uh, these treatments have been available for severe asthma, chronic spontaneous urticaria, uh, and other conditions. And when used, uh, especially for food allergies, uh, it, it's demonstrating that this could be beneficial preventing anaphylaxis. We have a ways to go before we fully understand how best to utilize these different treatment options. We have to consider cost as well, uh, duration of treatment. There's a lot more details to kind of tease out, but I just want to offer this because I think that these are very exciting times and we're going to have even more exciting conversations in the very near future about ways that we can manage anaphylaxis. So as we wrap up here, our understanding of anaphylaxis has really evolved in recent years. I truly hope that I provided information today that makes you say, Dave, you are a fool. I've never heard this before, but really I just want to make you question anything that you sort of felt that you, you, you felt was true in the first place. And let's use evidence to help guide our understanding of this. Um, a lot of our prior presumptions are really just outdated and incorrect. And then we need to spend time. This really requires a lot of time and education and it's going to be okay. Um, so I hope that this was helpful for all of you. I'm really uh, welcome to uh, any questions. I appreciate you coming here. I want to end on this quote. I don't know if those of you out there are Ted Lasso fans, but this is a big challenge. So it's not going to be easy and it's going to make a lot of us very uncomfortable as we do this, but that's progress. That's how we move forward uh, and that's how we drive change. So with that, um, Sally, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Stukas. You shared so much fabulous information. And as predicted, we have quite a few questions. Our first one is from Tracy, who's a school nurse. She says, is there any data on students getting an anaphylactic reaction because someone was drinking milk or eating peanut butter at lunch, then went out to the playground to play and returned to the classroom? I'm not aware of anything uh, credible or, or substantial that supports that. That's, uh, that would be a low risk scenario. So we know ingestion when it comes to food allergy is the, the highest risk factor for causing anaphylaxis and casual exposure through contact on the skin is a much lower risk. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tracy also went on to say, we offer dedicated supplies, dedicated computers, no food in the classroom, but a parent is requesting that every student wash their hands before ending, entering the classroom. Is this necessary? You know, hand washing is an easy thing to do. And I think, especially now, it, it's a, I think it makes a lot of sense for a variety of reasons. So one, it, it can effectively remove food allergen from the skin. Two, with the world, the infectious diseases that we're all facing with, I think good hand washing is really helpful. Um, so I think that's much more useful than even like dedicated stations and things like that, from my personal opinion. But I do encourage everybody to look at really the latest food allergy guidelines for management in the schools, because they do walk through uh, these different scenarios. There's a, a group in Canada that put, put together guidelines and then a group in the United States as well. Thank you very much. Um, the next question speaks to something that we dealt with for a long time. I was in my past life, I was a school nurse and most schools in their policies and protocols have, if, they, if epinephrine is given, students must be transported to the emergency room. What would be your recommendation to a school nurse who's working on their school protocols? I would not change that. I think, you know, everything I talked about was at home management. That doesn't apply to schools, restaurants, workplace, things like that. I mean, the school setting, it, there's too many variables at play there. So no, I, I think that that absolutely should stand. And if you give epinephrine to a student, uh, you need to call EMS and then have them come and assess and, and go from there. Thank you so much. I know that's gonna help a lot of school nurses. Uh, our next question comes from Jess. She says, I'm a new mother with a severe nut allergy, along with several more milder allergies. How do I navigate the fear of introducing allergens to my eight month old? I know early and often is the current recommendation, but the fear of a reaction is holding us back. 
Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, Jess, and you're not alone. And um, I hope you can find an allergist that you trust um, that it can work with you and try to provide reassurance. And one thing we offer at our center is if you have any concerns at all, if you have these if-then questions, come hang out with us. We do a thousand oral food challenges a year. You want to, you, if you're worried about what's going to happen when we feed your baby, come feed the baby in our office and we'll show you what's going to happen. And more often than not, nothing's going to happen. And even if symptoms do occur, uh, it's very empowering and we'll walk you through it. So I hope that you can find an allergist you trust. There are, there are great resources out there to find board certified allergists in your area. See, I think I'd move to your town, Dr. Stukas, after an offer like that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Jennifer's asking if it's possible to get a copy of the slideshow. We don't provide the slides for our um, CME and CNE um, programs because that's uh, just not what you do when you're offering credit for it. However, you can access the recording to listen to it again and take any notes that you might like to do. So, um, so next question is, someone said, you're talking about uh, expired epinephrine. Can you really still use them after the expiry date? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, again, you want to have an active prescription if you can, but if that's all you have available, use it. You're not going to cause any harm. Uh, and we know that they are still viable for, for a long time afterwards. I think there's efforts to try to change the um, prescribing, uh, the um, expiration date for, through manufacturers, but there's a lot of uh, red tape involved in that. But no, uh, yeah, no, that I think that's well established. And um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, Alan's asking, how often do egg and milk allergies cause severe to fatal reactions? Uh, fatal reactions are very rare to them, but they can occur. Um, and then, you know, severe reactions, it, it, there's a lot of variables involved there. But no, milk and egg can cause severe reactions. But um, just because you have that diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a severe reaction, as we sort of addressed through the talk today. Okay, this next one's kind of long, so hang in there with me. Uh, right. As a school nurse who's only in a school district once a week to once a month, depending on the size of the district, I often see uh, uh, medication orders for different allergies that direct to give Benadryl first and then give Epi if symptoms continue. Our state does not allow nurses to delegate assessment to school staff, but more importantly, they're delaying giving epinephrine, especially if there's a 30 minute or longer EMS response time. I hear you saying do not delay giving epinephrine, but what's your recommendation having a discussion with doctors prescribing this way? Uh, yeah, have the discussion. Just, you know, talk about, you know, I, I saw a great webinar on the allergy and asthma network that talked about an updated approach to anaphylaxis. Share the recent guidelines. Um, and just because, you know, the policy or the treatment guidelines state that, I mean, these are guidelines. If you have a student in front of you who looks unwell, give them epinephrine. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get in trouble with that. Uh, there's stock epinephrine laws in every single state now. Most of them are voluntary, but they're also good Samaritan laws. So if you give epinephrine when it's not necessarily necessary, there are no repercussions to you. So there's a reason why these are widely available. It's because they work really well uh, and they're very safe to use. And Lori, I'll just add to that. As a school nurse, I had a, a, a doctor who was absolutely adamant that their children have Benadryl uh, before and and watch them and then give epinephrine if necessary. And I had a and and you know he was just absolutely vehement. And I did have one student that one time just again didn't look good. So I go ahead gave the Benadryl at, and then immediately gave the epinephrine so that I was following the doctor's orders. But I made sure I get got the child what they needed. So there's kind of always a way to manage things. Okay. Um, Type 1 latex allergy wasn't mentioned, but I can tell that inhalation latex particles from latex balloons can cause anaphylaxis, plus unknowingly touching something that was cross-contaminated. Uh, uh, is epinephrine the first thing to give in this situation? It starts with the diagnosis. If you are having anaphylaxis, regardless of the exposure route, regardless of the cause, epinephrine is absolutely always the right treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Mackenzie. Says that when you mentioned that 80% of anaphylactic reactions will resolve within minutes, is that after epinephrine or without any epinephrine? Both. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot. You know, anaphylaxis is 
across the board, you know, often a self-resolved condition, but that's not going to happen within minutes. It's more 80% will resolve after one dose of epinephrine very quickly. So uh, it's a great treatment. It's not an emergency treatment. It's a treatment. It's a treatment for anaphylaxis. Uh, you don't need to wait for somebody's airway to be closing to diagnose anaphylaxis or use epinephrine. Um, ep it, the earlier you use it, the better it works. It just makes people feel better. Thank you so much. Wendy has our next question. Is there a good enough reason, is there evidence to require nut-free tables in a school lunchroom? Uh, the evidence supporting nut-free schools is pretty pretty um, bare. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, if we do a nut-free table in the lunchroom, that's a more focused mitigation strategy. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I also think that that's just a blanket approach. Um, and again, that doesn't help kids who have other food allergies. Uh, so I think it depends on the size of the school, uh, depends on each student and their own individual risk, and this is a nuanced conversation. I don't think it's something that every school needs to do. Okay, and we have time for one more question, and we have so many more left. I wish we could get to all of them. Uh, the next question comes from Jacqueline. Is it okay to give two 0.15 milligram EpiPens to a patient instead of 1.3 milligram dose if that's more what you have. If that's all you got, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, great. And we're just going to conclude with, uh, with one of our listeners says, I don't have a question, but I just want to thank you so much for this common sense approach to treating allergies and clear direction to, uh, on, to, to not to wait to use epinephrine. Hopefully schools will be willing to change policies and allow the school nurse to observe the student rather than having to call 911 every single time. Your presentation helped me better understand why one of my high school students had an anaphylactic reaction only during exercise. Thank you so much. Dr. Stukas, we are so grateful for you being with us today. I think you've answered a ton of questions uh, during your talk, as well as, as during our question and answer time. And we're just so pleased you could be with us today. So thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for joining. And I'd also like to thank our listeners for being with us today. Now at this time, please download that certificate of attendance from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the link in your emails. Please join us for our next Advances in Allergy and Asthma webinar as we look at digital health at the intersection of tech and touch. The webinar will be on January 26th at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Please watch our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org for registration information as we get towards the new year. You can also view our recorded webinars at our, on our website as well. Please visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergy and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thanks again for joining us today. Please stay online for two to three minutes to complete the evaluation survey. This is Sally Schessler for the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. Thank you for joining us for important information on anaphylaxis, and we look forward to having you join us again next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. <music>